coming to us this morning uh, here on the east coast of the United States uh, is Tyler Amick. Uh, he teaches middle school geography and language arts for Austin Public Schools in, in Minnesota. Uh, he formerly taught in Lyle, Minnesota and joined NAVA in 2012. Tyler will be presenting on teaching about flags in Lyle, Minnesota. Tyler, over to you. My presentation today is based on a elective class that I taught uh, during, during the pandemic, well, partially during the pandemic. So uh, uh, President Heimer's remarks kind of fit in well here because we're talking about the pandemic as well as scholarly pursuits. To give uh, some background to this, uh, for the 2019-2020 school year uh, at Lyle Public School, I taught an elective entitled Flags, a uh, simple title. Uh, it was a one semester course offered in the spring. Uh, and then the final project for it was to design a flag for uh, the community of Lyle. 15 students participated overall. And this presentation and the paper that it's based off of uh, was really focused on you know, the curriculum uh, that I put together for it, the class outcomes for it, and what lessons uh, can be learned for you know, other teachers who might want to uh, incorporate flags or vexillological material in their classes. Um, so I'm really gonna try and thread the needle here to make this both accessible and informative to both teachers on the audience as well as flag enthusiasts who might not have a background in uh, educational theory. So here we go. Uh, some background, uh, Lyle, Minnesota, uh, very, very far south, uh, Minnesota, right along the Iowa border. It's a very small town. Uh, the estimated population uh, is 554. Uh, and the class for it, uh, graduating classes range between 15 and 25 on average. So again, very small town. Um, and part of the problem with that is, you know, there's not a whole lot of staff uh, at Lyle Public School. So just about everyone has to do an elective, but they're pretty flexible on it. Uh, and so I figured might as well experiment a little and teach an entire elective on flags. The administration thought it was kind of cool. Uh, they said, go for it. And so I started planning. Um, and so I knew from the get-go, I wanted this to be, you know, a very informed class that might be rec replicable uh, by other teachers. So I tried to incorporate as much uh, pedagogy, uh, as much educational philosophy in it as possible. Uh, the first primary inspiration for uh, putting together the curriculum uh, was an older theory by Lev Vygotsky uh, called the Zone of Proximal Development. Um, the, it's demonstrated here, the basics of it is uh, there's essentially three zones for tasks or concepts uh, when it comes to students. Uh, the central darker circle here uh, is everything a, a student can do unaided. Like, you know, what skills are they able to do? What are they able to learn without any help whatsoever? The second zone, which is known as the zone of proximal development, that is where it gets challenging for students, but they can achieve it with uh, teacher assistance. And then the third zone uh, is what students can't do even with teacher assistance. The theory goes that you know the best place to learn is in this zone of proximal development where students are challenged, where they need teacher assistance. Um, so the theory of ZPD of zone of proximal development really emphasizes challenging students with teacher assistance. I also knew that you know dealing with flags, a lot of these students had no experience with flags. So that center zone, the stuff that students already knew about flags was gonna be kind of small. Um, a theory, like a educational philosophy that goes with this uh, scaffolding, um, kind of like you know scaffolding on buildings. Um, it's about taking chunks and building up. Uh, so building a level and then building another level on it, so on and so forth, uh, building up. Rebecca Alber, uh, 
uh, author with Edutopia described scaffolding as breaking up learning into chunks uh, and providing a tool or structure with each chunk. Um, so uh, when I talk about like what the class actually looked like, you will uh, be able to see that scaffolding take place. Uh, third design feature with this was backwards design. Uh, this was created by uh, Grant Wiggins and Jay McTeague. Um, and the whole idea is to identify what course learning outcomes you want students to have at the end of the year, like when all is said and done what you want them to know, and then build up the lessons to reach those goals. And then the final thought that I had on this, and this is probably the most controversial uh, part of the curriculum here, uh, is thinking about coursework. Now, this is an elective class. Students are taking it in addition to their math, their science, their social studies. They are opting into this. Um, so their student participation is essentially voluntary. So I don't wanna bog them down with homework. And then I'm also teaching a bunch of other classes as well. I'll be honest, I didn't necessarily want to grade another class's homework in addition. Um, and so there's a philosophy uh, proposed by Alfie Cohn um, to just not assign homework. Uh, his belief, his studies show that there's no academic benefit uh, to assigning homework to children before high school. And even in high school, the benefit is marginal and that might be more correlation rather than causation. Um, so I decided that, you know, this is an elective, uh, this is a brand new class, I might as well experiment. Um, and so I tried throwing this in by not assigning homework. So uh, how the curriculum shaped down is I ended up uh, creating this class for the whole semester it consisted of four units, flag basics, heraldry, flags and culture, and flag design. Uh, I'll get into what these individual units look like in a little bit, uh, but probably the biggest part of this uh, that shakes things up is there was no homework. Um, there's only two things in gra the grade book for each unit, and that is a set of notes and a unit test. And then that final unit of uh, flag design was project-based. So each unit ended up being in the grade book worth 50 points. Um, 15 points were for a note sheet. Uh, I would hand out a note sheet at the beginning of the unit. This would be all the topics I would talk about. Um, and then uh, a test. And the students could use their notes on the test. And for the notes, they were graded on you know, simple completion. So in terms of what we'd consider academic rigor, in terms of like, you know, lots of stuff, lots of testing, that wasn't the case here. It was more on, you know, learning outcomes. Um, each unit varied greatly, activities, lectures, reading articles, so on and so forth. Um, and then another aspect of it is with each unit, I had five flags assigned to it uh, that I would ask students to familiarize themselves with, to be able to recognize like them and their components. Uh, and again, each unit culminated in a test where they'd be tested out the stuff on the note sheet as well as those five flags. Um, the first unit, uh, flag basics, uh, this is the one where I'm like, okay, let's hit the ground running, let's get students, uh, the language, the vocabulary needed to talk about flags. Um, so uh, we really focused on basic stuff, talking about design based on language to talk about it. So, you know, what is a fly? What is a hoist? What does vexillology mean? You know, what are cantons or Scandinavian crosses? Stuff like that. Uh, these were all just based on how to talk about flags. Um, and here's a couple examples of the flags that they had to familiarize themselves with. Um, this is where scaffolding come in because this first unit I'm focusing on vocab. The next unit, uh, which is heraldry, I'm focusing on design. So my hope was that uh, these two units would then uh, fit together well. Uh, so the second unit uh, focused on European style heraldry and heraldic design. I know not necessarily 
part of vexillology, but vexillology adjacent. Um, I wanted to incorporate this because uh, heraldry is a interesting tool to teach students about the power of like what just colors or geometric shapes can have on the meaning of a design. Um, and so with this, I had students do more hands-on activity, uh, designing heraldry, interacting with like real heraldic devices uh, to try and, you know, understand how visual symbolism can be come across. Some vocab examples include escutcheon, ordinaries, attitudes. Uh, and here's a couple of the flags I had them uh, familiarize themselves with uh, for this unit. Um, the third unit, uh, flags and culture. This one uh, was the unit that I really wanted to focus on, you know, the power of flags. Uh, the first unit, you know, the language, second unit, the design, the third unit is like how people interact with flags, the intersection of flags and culture, cultural flashpoints. Um, and so we talked about, you know, how flags can be controversial, how they can be politically charged, how they can be culturally significant in different communities based off of the colors or designs they had. Um, so this unit, we talked about Confederate flags. Uh, we talked about pride flags. We talked about how flags are used uh, during uh, the Hong Kong protests or you know, Pan-African and Pan-Arab flags, how simple colors can represent entire cultures. Um, and then the final unit, uh, flag design. My original intent was to have students um, take what they learned from these different units, uh, you know, the different words to describe things, uh, understanding how basic designs can affect symbolism, um, you know, how different color patterns or different symbols could have cultural relevance or be culturally charged, that sort of thing. Um, and then use this to do a number of projects, designing different flags, like a flag for the class, a flag for the students, a flag for the students' families, that sort of thing. And then have uh, gradually introduce them to like graphic design software. And then have the final project then be uh, designing a uh, flag design for Lyle using graphic design software. And then we'd submit these designs to the city council. Uh, Unfortunately, this is not how it worked out uh, because uh, our school closed for distance learning before we were able to start this unit. Um, and we encountered a number of problems with this. Number one, we weren't able to download the graphic design software on the students' iPads before we left. Um, we weren't able to you know, work together as a class to familiarize ourselves with that software. Um, and so we were kind of lost there. And then also some of my students had struggles with internet access. Uh, they had struggles with having to babysit their younger siblings during the day while their parents worked. Um, and so I didn't want to introduce another big project into what they were already dealing with. Um, and so I allowed students to opt out of the final project. Instead, they could do a series of articles, like read a series of articles on the topic um, and just, you know, do some basic stuff. And so what ended up happening is only a small number of students ended up participating in this flag design process. But ultimately, I think it turned out well. Uh, we were able to get all the students back together to select uh, designs from what was submitted um, and to send these to the Lyle City Council uh, ahead of their May meeting. Uh, these were the top five that we presented. Uh, the city council prefer, uh, preferred design number three, the one in the middle uh, with the black, blue, and the gold star, uh, but they asked for some revisions to be made. Um, I didn't mention this specifically, but uh, I should have mentioned it earlier. Uh, from the get-go, the Lyle city council was on board with this. In fact, uh, the mayor of Lyle was a bus driver for the school. Um, and so I had multiple in-person conversations with him about this. He was excited for it. He actually had a couple of grandkids in my flag class. Uh, so I guess that helped uh, encourage him. Um, 
but also this was timed along with uh, their 100th uh, anniversary of the founding of the city, um, or 150th anniversary. Um, and so they were excited to get this and they were like, yes, we want a flag design designed by students. However, um, none of the designs that we submitted really ticked all the boxes for uh, the city council. Um, they prefer that design number three, um, but they asked for a couple revisions. Number one, uh, they felt the flag was too dark as is, uh, and they thought it needed lightening. And number two, they asked, wanted to add text to the flag. They wanted to add text reading uh, Lyle, Minnesota, 1870. Their original uh, intention was to add it in white in the top left corner of the uh, black uh, field. Now I worked with the student designer to accommodate both requests. Uh, we added in a uh, white fimbriation, we lightened the, the shade of blue. Um, we both objected to the addition of the text, uh, but the city council was pretty insistent on it. Eventually we were able to come to a compromise uh, and add just the 1870. And this uh, compromise revision of it was adopted uh, during their July meeting. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, presenting it this this year um, is quite useful. I was gonna present this last year, but the flag wouldn't have been adopted then. Now, some lessons that I've learned uh, from this that I think are applicable to anyone who wants to teach more about flags uh, for educational pursuits going forward. Number one, I learned that this curricular structure worked well. Students loved coming to class uh, getting rid of the homework aspect of it, reducing the amount of like stuff that I'm actually grading, actually increased student buy-in. Uh, they were excited to come in because they felt that what they were doing in class, you know, was more important than busy work. They came in with the expectation that, oh, hey, we're learning about the world, we're learning about stuff that's important, and we don't have to worry about, you know, stupid grades. Um, and honestly, I loved it. It was uh, a fantastic way of teaching for me. Now for other teachers, it might not work out as well, uh, might be different for different teachers. So uh, that's one thing that's a more me lesson learned. But another thing I learned is to incorporate more hands-on activities. Students appreciated learning about, you know, issues in the world around them, you know, pride flags, the Confederate flags, that sort of thing. Uh, but the activities that were more popular were the creative hands-on projects, designing heraldry, designing flags. Um, and so one lesson that I learned is that hands-on activities definitely get students more engaged with flags than just, you know, talking about it. Another thing I learned is to refine vocabulary. I would still consider myself a flag novice. Um, I'm still a novice in the world of vexillology. Uh, and so I'm still learning, um, but I definitely did include more unnecessary words I needed to. So uh, in future pursuits, I need to focus on broad terminology that helps uh, in the basic discussion of flags. Uh, to give an example of this, I included some more specific vocab terms like a swallowtail or an inescuchin. Um, and yeah, kind of important to talk about when we're getting into specifics. And I taught my students about it. They learned about what a swallowtail and an inescuchin were, but they weren't useful going into other uh, units. So uh, get rid of some of the more specific vocab terms and focus more on broad terminology. Uh, another lesson that I learned uh, in this year after, uh, this past year I was teaching middle school social studies, teaching geography, and I incorporated physical flags in my classroom uh, based on what I learned uh, through my flags class. Um, and so what I've learned is other than being, you know, great ways to decorate the classroom, uh, having physical flags helps students 
feel more connected to flags than just seeing like a simple JPEG on their computer. Like they understood what flags were supposed to look like, you know, what it looked like when the uh, HVAC kicked on and started flapping them against the wall, that sort of thing. Um, and I think the most important thing, and this is something that I think all of NAVA uh, can learn from, is that flags in lessons, in classroom lessons, are a viable option. You know, students really bought into it when I taught just my flags class. And with my middle schoolers this past year incorporating flags into geography, they really got a kick out of it. Um, and so I think this is, you know, something that I'm going to push for in the future um, at my school on incorporating more flags. Uh, and I think it's something that NAVA should push for as well. So that's my uh, presentation. Are there any questions? I saw the chat was flashing. Um, yes. Are we some folks are asking some similar questions. Uh, so let me ask you this. Uh, do you feel the class overall was successful and do you plan uh, to have the class again or I should say course because it lasted the semester right uh, and uh, what kinds of things uh, do you feel uh, if you're going if the class was successful and you plan to have it again uh, what are the issues you think uh, are maybe your one or two top things that you would continue yeah um, so yes, the class was very successful. A thing that I do with all my classes, um, just to get some data to improve my teaching is that I have them take an end of the year survey. You know, how did the class go? How did Mr. Amick teach? That sort of thing. And I had really glowing reviews on it. A lot of students really appreciated it. Um, you know, they had fun learning about different flags. I had students come up to me and be like, yeah, no, I've you know, seen, I noticed that there was a Japan flag outside of Hormel, and I had asked my parents questions about that, and I know I wouldn't have asked those questions if I didn't have this class. I probably wouldn't have paid attention to those flags. Um, I think that was really cool. Um, I do hope to teach it again one day um, at the district I'm at now, uh, Austin. Uh, it's much larger. Graduating classes between 300 and 400 students um, and so there's a little bit more roadblocks in terms of setting up electives, uh, but one day, hopefully I'll teach it again. Um, I think one of the main issues when setting up a class like this is the size of the school um, and what, uh, what you need to prove in order to get that class approved. You know, do you need you know, to reach certain state standards or stuff like that. Um, and so that will require some future planning. Um, I know at Austin, they do have some more requirements on that. So uh, next year I'll apply to get, uh, to teach this elective again, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, uh, thank you, Tyler. A, a couple of things real quick. Uh, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, could you, Cover again, just very quickly, what age group and, and grade uh, or grades that you covered with this class? Right, yeah, sorry. Um, so this was for just high schoolers. Um, and I had students ranging in age from ninth grade to 12th grade. Um, and so I had 15 students. Um, I had mostly 10th graders um, in it, but I had a couple seniors, a couple juniors, and a couple freshmen in it as well. So gotcha, that would gotcha. be uh, age 14 to age 18. Okay. And uh, did you have any, uh, because of the types of flags you may have covered, uh, you mentioned some of them, did you have any conflicts uh, amongst the students or between yourself and the students when potentially controversial flags uh, may have come up? And, and if so, how did you resolve that uh, to keep the class moving? Yeah. Um, since it was a smaller class, uh, most of the students I could tell that you might have had issues with it tend to be more quiet rather than causing issues. Um, I think one of the biggest discussions came around the Confederate flags. And so we talked about, you know, how different people have different interpretations of it um, and how, you know, flags are symbols, they're visceral symbols that, you know, people have uh, strong feelings about um, and how public display of those symbols might be interpreted differently. Um, and so I 
I really went uh, for an approach that got students to think about, you know, what interpretations people might have of flags when they'd see just the flag displayed, like nothing about the person. Um, so talking about, you know, what connotations arrive with some of those controversial flags. Um, but yeah, no, there, there weren't too many issues. I think students were more interested in being able to learn about this thing that other teachers might just like ignore or that might push off. I feel like it made them feel like responsible young adults to learn about and talk about uh, controversial things that uh, other adults might not otherwise talk with them about. I, I think that's terrific and, and a great thing that uh, uh, flags can can help uh, raise that kind of uh, awareness in, in young minds. So I, I think that's terrific, Tyler. Uh, we have about a minute left, so I just wanted to ask you a quick couple of yes or no uh, questions. Uh, yeah. Did you share uh, your successes with the teachers uh, in your school? Yes. Okay. How did the students uh, take the uh, the final determination by your your uh, your city board as far as the the final selection was concerned? Um, they thought that they chose a well put flag. Um, my students as a whole were generally not a fan of the idea of adding lettering to it. Um, I had a couple students who still. Uh, we're of the opinion that lettering on city flags are useful, and you know that's their opinion. I'll, but like it was, it was a interesting uh, mix of responses. <laughs> that's terrific, terrific. Well, uh, Tyler, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and and uh, the information that you've passed on. Uh, to the